morning. Morning. Such a pleasure to be back in the house of God. The place where the Lord has placed his name is the place to be. A city set on a hill, right? That's right. The place where whose city and maker is God. Did y'all hear the prophetic word from Pastor Jake? Amen. I said, did y'all hear Amen, sir. the prophetic word from yes. Pastor Jake? Yes. Yes. The Lord was kind of stirring in my heart about silence. I shared a word with Pastor Zeke and then Pastor Jake pipes in with Ezekiel 37. And when the prophet says, thou knowest, he's expressing this, his heart that only God knows, right? It's probably a little bit of just him not, you know, timidity maybe, perhaps, right? He wasn't silent, he just said, thou knows, right? And then Jake says, well, you tell the dry bones to live. Amen. Which is what God told the prophet. Speak. Amen. Speak. And then, did you hear that he was admonishing us and encouraging us to do the same thing. Amen. Yes. Did you hear that? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Some of us may have dry bones or know someone that has dry bones and that we needed to speak to those dry bones and tell them to live. Were you silent? Wow. Sir, was everybody silent? Oh, yes, Silence is agreeance. So if you don't speak, that means you agree that those dry bones are simply gonna stay dry. I won't be silent. Good word. In, in Acts chapter four. Verse 16, it says, saying, what should we do to these men? For that indeed a noble miracle has been done by them is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. This is the Pharisees, or the, the workers of darkness, the satanic idolaters. And they want to silence the apostles. And then they say in verse 17, because they don't want it to spread any further among the people, let us straightly threaten them that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. Isn't that what the enemy wants you to do? He wants to shut Chris up and tell him that he is his past and not who God says he is. And so he's silent. Now I'm not saying you are silent, but if you are, then receive it. Because what it means is I'm in agreement with the spirit of timidity. A spirit of fear, not of in agreement with the spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. Right? But listen to what the apostles spoke. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, 
whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, you be the judge of that. That's your problem. It's not my problem. You, you have to bear that burden. But we cannot speak, for we cannot but speak. I can't help it. I can't help it. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and we have heard. Wow. Is, is that how you're stirred in your spirit? Are you stirred in such a way that you can't help but speak? Well, I encourage you today, if you're not, Come alongside your brothers. Yes. Come on. And allow your brothers to hold up your arms and encourage you in this way. Hallelujah. That you may reach the prize for which you originally accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Amen. Because as long as you're silent, you're still in agreement with the powers of darkness. You're not walking in the light. That was just a word. Wanted to share that with you. Love you guys. And that word, I pray you received it with love because, well, it's the word of the Lord. And his desire that would be that none of us would perish. Amen. Come on, let's try. And your silence is leading you to destruction. I have no idea how I'm going to articulate what the word has been putting on what the Lord's been putting on my heart. And I know I don't have much time, so the pauses I like to do in between words, I have to limit. <laughs> but Trenda and I had been praying in a certain capacity. Because through much travail, we have been learning how to shepherd the way the Lord shepherds. Come on now. And the implications of that require submitting fully to the ancient path. A pattern we think we know. Because we've been so influenced by the traditions of men and the structures that we've been so accustomed to. And yet we know of our God, but we don't yada. The yada implies something very intimate with the ways of the Lord in which the Lord calls us up to. In a couple months back, I've been praying about my heart. Always seeking the Lord to cultivate my heart in a way that reflects His heart. That's right. Yeah. Knowing that the heart is deceitfully wicked. My heart's wicked. The quicker you come to that realization and believe Jeremiah 17, you might begin to grow. Your heart tells you what's good is good, bad, and what's bad is good, and you're very confused most often. Lacking vision. 
And in the course of shepherding, it requires great patience. It begins in the home with the children and then those that the Lord has entrusted to. And it requires great patience. Something of which only the love of God abounding in my heart can accomplish. The same long suffering and patience that he has had for me, I'm called to bestow likewise upon my brothers and sisters. And yet the spirit convicts you when you know your your spirit is uneasy about the circumstance, and yet the Lord caused me to trust him with the circumstance and be anxious for nothing. Amen. Amen. With no self-seeking agenda or preconceived ideas about outcomes. All right. And one day I was perusing through the scripture and I came across 2 Timothy 4, chapter 2. 2 Timothy 4, verse 2. It says, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort. With great patience and instruction. And it's that great patience part of this that uh, really kicks against the flesh. Because the, the flesh has its own agenda. It's very selfish. And it does not easily look to the things of others nor esteem others greater than itself. And so the weaknesses or flaws we see in our brothers turn into anxiety in our flesh. Though we want to see them walk in their calling, the truth is anything that's done through the flesh is probably seeking some some validation of its own. So if I lack patience with my brother, in what the Lord is doing in his life, and in his family's life, and I can only see what's in front of me, my vision is not only small, it's blinded and it's dumb. I'm a I'm stupid. Right? I'm very foolish in my estimations. And there's no doubt some selfish ambitions that are rising up within me. But let's take a moment and look at the way Jesus treated the disciples. And as we look at this, let's consider how we are to engage and treat our brothers and our sisters. Forget about y'all. Matthew 28, verses 16 through 18. There's a disparity in where the disciples are and where the Lord is actually taking them. There's a margin, there's a gap. Right? It says... Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. 
And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. There's a there's a gap there. Because if you think about the context of Matthew 28, he's given ready to give them their commission. Some doubted. It wasn't just Thomas. Some doubted. But they all worshipped him. Perhaps the ones that doubted should be discarded. No. Perhaps we should only focus on the fact that they doubted. We should wrestle with that day and night. No, it's meditating on his word day and night. But get this. Jesus surely knew they doubted, right? And it says, And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. He entrusted the gospel of the kingdom to men that doubted. And yet, through our own selfish ambition often or blind and dumb vision, we may look at our brother or some body that's new to the faith and be wholly focused on their doubts or their fears or their anxieties or all of their weaknesses and not see them for the name that the Lord has given them. And in this example, it's so subtle. You can just read past this. Yep. And yet, so beautiful because this is his love for his children. He's dealing with them the way a father deals with his son. There's a disparity there, there's a gap there in where they are, but it doesn't change his mind about who they are. And this is the work of darkness, that we would actually look back at who we are and say, well, I can't be who God has called me to be. And then... It, it can even be compounded by the fact that we have a brother that only ministers to our weaknesses. But doesn't call us up. Doesn't build us up. Doesn't strengthen us. And do it with love. I mean, think about it. These are the same disciples that fell asleep in the garden. And in Matthew 17, he called them a faithless and perverse generation. Because they could not heal the demoniac. They didn't have the thing to do. He says, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer with you? And yet he does. He does suffer. He does strive with them. Right? He doesn't give up on his brother. Right. Come on. Good. 
and nor does he pull them down because of what he can just only see in front of his nose. Unless he only wants to build them up just enough to where his brother is not elevated above him. Wow. Would you lay down your life and all of your ambitions for the success of another? Do you, do you know this is a pattern of how the Lord advances his kingdom? If you don't know, we encourage you to come alongside us and get to know this is this is the way he does it. And this is not new. Turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 18. Jesus was given all power and authority and he then bestows that power and authority on the disciples. Such a beautiful thing. He didn't consider it something to be just for himself. Verse 1, Now it came about when he had finished speaking to Saul that the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David. And Jonathan loved him as himself. Saul took him that day and did not let him return to his father's house. Then Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was on him and gave it to David with his armor, including his sword and his bow and his belt. So David went out wherever Saul sent him and prospered. Would you do it? I mean, I don't know. It would seem like to me Jonathan perhaps could be the next in line behind Saul. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Why would Jonathan yoke himself to a man that is going to be elevated above him by God? Why would he do it? It's so contrary to the world structure. But we must know this is how the Lord advances his kingdom. And this is the heart by which we must do it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Jonathan is storing up a treasure in heaven. This is, his, this is going to be his crown. Yeah, He's laying down his life for his brother. Yeah. He's exalting him in this moment. This is no light thing for a man to give up his armor. Yeah. And not only that, for the son of the king to give it up. And it was pleasing in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. See, Jonathan believed the God in David. That's the difference between selfish ambition and the, and the mindset that says, 
I'm, I want to bring God all the glory. I want to advance God's kingdom. I don't care about advancing my own agenda. I want to see my children one million fold anything good I've done for the kingdom of God. I want to see Corey, Oscar, Michael Spence, everyone here, likewise. Unless I feel like I'm going to get left out. Unless I'm going to feel, oh, God's just forget, going to forget about me. Have you ever been in a meeting and the Lord put a word on your heart and you got to share it, didn't get to share it, I'm sorry, didn't get to share it, and you left that meeting mad because someone else shared it? Or perhaps you just didn't get to share it? What is that? And you may not be mad, but there's a little bit of like, yeah, I really wanted to share that. Yes. Selfish ambition. And it's so subtle. And I'm so grateful that I'm, I'm amongst brothers and sisters who want to see their brothers elevate. Come on, that's it. It's, it's no matter to them or concern that Chris Spence would outshine me any given day. Right? Or somebody is promoted to a position first. Let's move on. 1 Samuel 20, verse 3, Yet David vowed again, saying, Your father knows well that I have found favor in your sight, and he has said, Do not let Jonathan know this, or he will be grieved. But truly, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, there is hardly a step between me and death. Then Jonathan said to David, Whatever you say, I will do for you. Wow. I will come alongside you. I'll do it for you. Will you do that for your brother? Will you make that declaration that even if that's not something that's in your heart, will you ask God for it? Will you pay attention to this word right now? And listen intently. The way the implication is this is that there is no concern for your own life. And it reminds me of Paul who in Acts 20 says, I did not consider my life dear to myself so that I might finish my course in the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God and yes I know Paul is speaking in the context of afflictions but the principle is still the same Jesus put a high value on you when he endured the cross for your sins. He did not consider his own life dear to himself unto the point of death. Will you lay down your life to serve your brother? This is the work of the Holy Ghost. So if you find it difficult to bear witness with it, 
if your flesh is kicking right now, there's another conversation to be had concerning walking in the Spirit and or perhaps being filled with the Holy Ghost. Because the Spirit of God will convict you of this if you are filled with the Spirit. Would you die to your flesh to see your brother elevate? Jesus exalted you in his death. Y'all realize that? He counted you worthy? Perhaps we can't see our brother that way because we don't know our own value. We don't rightly perceive the price that Jesus paid on the cross for our sins. And we don't see ourselves the way he saw us. So then how can I see my brother? Well, I need help. Does anybody doubt if you ask the Lord for help, he'll help you? Will he help you, Marty? Yes. Joseph. Yeah, I caught you off guard, didn't I? <laughs> will, I help, will, will Jesus help you if you ask him? Will you ask him? Jordan. Will Jesus help you? Will he help you see rightly? Will he get the plank out of your eye so you can rightly see your brother and see this church body? Make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in the spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as, in, as more important than yourself. I know you've heard all these scriptures before, and you're so familiar with them, and they're great. They're great. They're beautiful. Not usually that dramatic, but really it, it wars in my heart that way because the familiarity with God's word has desensitized us to what he's speaking. We think we're doing it because we've heard it so much. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves that was also in Christ Jesus. The, the Lord isn't asking us to do anything that he hasn't already done for us. And to do anything less goes right back to that word. Well, man, we just want to keep it for ourselves. Or perhaps when you became a Christian, you didn't realize that this was going to be required of you. Is this a part of it? You mean I got a abound in love? I need a heart transplant? I need instead of a heart of stone, I need a, a heart of flesh? Yes, Michael Parker, you do. Otherwise you're just a noisy gong. Useless the kingdom of God. But he emptied himself taking the form of a bond servant. Depending on what version made himself with no reputation. And being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as man, he humbled himself. By becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. He paid it all. Full price. Full capacity. For the sake of others. 
for the proper working of what God the Father called him to do. For the establishing and the building up of the church. He paid it all. <laughs> Will you pay all? Daniel, will you pay full price? Will you give your brothers all that Jesus gave you? And humble yourself doing? Will you wash your brother's feet? It's a tough one. But if we're not willing to do so, Go back and read that. Will you withhold any good thing from your brother that would elevate him above you? Anything that would cause him to walk worthy of the calling, would you withhold it from him? Are you too busy? Are you too busy to see your brother elevated? Or are you too busy to be elevated? That's a good question too. I didn't think about that. Ephesians 4, chapter 1. We want to talk a little bit about the encouragement of the brethren. And the implications of that. It says, therefore I, I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk worthy, to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. Implore is also encourage. Let's get some other words like beseech and even pray. Also to give a name. Or to invite or to call aloud. And the one I love so much is the call to one side. So it's like this. I'm going to encourage Ezekiel. But in the course of my encouragement, what it means is it's this word parakaleo, which encourage translates in the Greek to call to one side. So I'm not just encouraging you to walk worthy of your calling, but I'm also calling you to walk with me. For the purpose of the, even of serving you and humbling myself under the mighty hand of God to see you built up in your most holy faith. I must decrease that Ezekiel would increase. Right? I'm called to see him the way the Lord sees him and not just where he is today. I'm to call them up to the call of God on his life. The design that God has established from heaven before he was even born, the Lord would have placed me in his life to be that instrument to call him up to the same service. But here's the implication, and here's why I may not do it for you, Ezekiel. I apologize. I'm, really, I'm sorry. My own life is not worthy of calling you aside by myself. But I may have enough ambition to try to build you up a little bit. to validate my ministry. My ministry. 
I just, I just might have enough selfish ambition. I may know enough scripture to correct you. But not enough to elevate you above me. So that you would be on a firm foundation and reach the call of God on your Because I just, I, I myself don't have it. I'm not walking with the Lord, so why would I in, encourage you to come alongside me? I mean, I, I have the appearance of it. I've got a look. I've got a facade of walking with Christ. But I don't really see my brother for who God has called him to be rightly because you know what? I still, I got the plank in my own eye. So I can't really encourage him the way Jesus has called me to encourage. I can't love him that. But I can fake it really good if I've been in the faith long enough. I can fake it really well. Galatians 6 says this, verse 1, Brethren, if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness.